Professor Douglas E. Oakman, welcome to my vlog. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to, to speak to us about this issue uh, of Jesus, death and the Lord's Prayer. Doug is with the Faculty of Religion at Pacific Lutheran University, although currently on sabbatical. Doug was the chair of the religious, uh, of the religious department from 1996 to 2003 and dean of humanities for six years after that. Doug is an internationally respected scholar and has published prolifically and is the author of Jesus and the Economic Questions of His Day, which was in 1986, The Political Aims of Jesus, 2012, and Jesus' Debt and the Lord's Prayer, which was 2014. And is not only an ordained minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, but also a small groups leader for campus ministry. During the 1990s, he participated in archaeological excavations in Galilee, which interests me, of course, because I've just returned from a United Reformed Church trip to Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. Your interest in the economics of Jesus seems to go back for many years. Very formative for me was to be ordained in an African-American church, to begin to think about how theology and economy and politics intersected. A great influence in my intellectual formation was to become a member of the Context Group, which was a seminar that ran for 30 years, integrating the social sciences into biblical studies. Uh, I had already written my dissertation, uh, which was published as Jesus and the Economic Questions of His Day. But the Context Group led me deeper into thinking about not only economy, but Jesus and politics. The first take on the Lord's Prayer, though, was in the late 80s. And then it became, as you know, a chapter then in the, the latest book I contribute on this, uh, Jesus, Death, and the Lord's Prayer. And at the end of the book, uh, I'll probably come back to this at the end of our conversation, I tried to imagine how uh, biblical economics would address a time when greed triumphs and trumps uh, an economy for need. So uh, I, I talk in that last uh, concluding part about uh, an economy that would address need as one of the great questions for the 21st century. And one that really is important because if we don't get our economy, our economic life straightened out, the planet's environment is going to be totally damaged. And not only are human beings uh, suffering uh, under uh, uh, the debt that we're talking about uh, in various ways in their lives, the way David Graeber talks about debt, but the, uh, the environment itself is suffering. I'd, I'd like to bring us back to your book, please, uh, Jesus, Debt and the Lord's Prayer. And you speak about debt as cen a central control mechanism for the administration of the Roman Empire. Can you tell us about a little bit about how this debt operated? So my focus is on the Galilee of Jesus. And the reason that I wanted to talk about unwritten obligations, patronage politics, uh, in this paper, uh, somewhat developed in the books previous, previously, is that uh, there were these dependency relationships work uh, in tandem. Uh, and I, I cite, for instance, that there were uh, debtors prisons and uh, tenants who are under pressure all the time uh, because as I say in the paper uh, they live from ground to mouth uh, and from seed to harvest without much backup um, conversely uh, the uh, landowner or the uh, ruling elites uh, use these dependency relationships both uh, in tenancy relationships uh, where there were contractual obligations, uh, patronage demanded loyalty and uh, obliged one to do things the way the landlord wanted. Of course, this is an agrarian economy. Uh, but Jesus' parable of uh, the uh, talents or the entrusted money also shows uh, what, what uh, Michael Hudson talks about that uh, silver debts were not forgiven. In fact, uh, they were powerful tools uh, in keeping uh, people uh, under the creditors, within the creditors' power. Uh, commerce and silver went together in Roman Galilee. 
only the ruling elites could engage in it, and I give some evidence for that in the paper. Uh, another interesting thing that I have studied over the years is the function of money within an agrarian setting. And the point I tried to make, in archaeology we only find, by and large, copper money. Uh, but you have to trade it up to silver mm. and at a disadvantage. So any loan of money in an agrarian setting uh, almost invariably uh, puts the uh, debtor in a uh, perpetual situation of debt. Uh, so uh, I'm looking at the situation through whatever evidence I can dredge up from the Bible, from Josephus, and from archeology. span But I'm also thinking about the situation based upon uh, an understanding of how patronage politics works uh, and obligation is a stronger control mechanism uh, especially if, if the peasantry or the villagers think there's no way we can get out of this it's a stronger control mechanism than the invocation of uh, the legions uh, but this was an area where uh, there were uh, uh, signs of agrarian unrest all the way from the death of Herod the Great to the Judean Roman War of 66 to 70. And um, uh, we see uh, at the time of Jesus, Herod Antipas kills John the Baptizer when he starts to gather crowds who get ideas uh, that aren't convenient for the ruler. Uh, Jesus, I think, uh, in, as I argue in the, that chapter on Jesus the Tax Resister, is involved with sitting down with the creditor enforcer and the debtors, tax collectors and sinners, to ask them over the table to write down the debts, to mitigate the debt pressure. And uh, Jesus also brokers help for those people. He associates with many landless people, including the fishers of Galilee. So. Uh, this is what I imagine and try to argue in the paper. Debtors' prisons exist. Uh, and the most interesting example that I think is uh, an authentic recollection of a, of a parable of Jesus is in Luke chapter 7. Jesus is invited to Simon the Pharisee's home for, for dinner. The triclinium is imagined. It's only men, and if women are there, it's for certain purposes only. Well, here's a woman wiping Jesus' feet. I imagine them reclining. Uh, Simon says, well, doesn't he know what, what her moral character is, if he were really a prophet? Uh, and while this sounds risque, I think this is actually helpful to think about this. Why does Jesus then tell a parable about two dead orders? one owing 500 and one owing 50 denarii apiece, each of, uh, uh, to the creditor. He doesn't talk about morality, he talks about debt. So I imagine that he has somehow alleviated her debt bondage in, in sex slavery, perhaps. The father could put her into that situation to help the family debt, okay? So uh, the one who has forgiven the more, uh, is the one who's most grateful. Uh, sort of like our tradition about St. Nicholas, who used the church's gold to buy women out of sex slavery or slavery. One of the things that you describe is how the periods of food, sort uh, food shortages, the periods that, um, that there was maybe famine, these were leveraged by the Roman elites to further enrich themselves. And just talk a little bit about that. The kingdom of God itself is a political metaphor. Uh, and so I, I interpret that to mean God's eminent, eminent domain over all things. Uh, but uh, Jesus carries on uh, this table practice, and I see the prayer of Jesus going along with that practice, particularly in the fifth petition. Uh, forgive us our debts, and I think Matthew has money debts uh, as we release those in debt to us. I read that as addressing both the situation of the credit enforcer or their scribes were in a fixed uh, debt situation. We have to we have to give it all to the creditor. 
Hmm. But the person on the other side of the table uh, is freed from their debt, or at least it's alleviated. Uh, so I, I see Jesus of Nazareth as a practical mitigator. Uh, he's not out in the wilderness like John the baptizer. He's actually uh, traveling for his work. And his parables show us his broad experience in the Galilee of the early first century. And many estate parables, uh, which consider the, the role and practices of the estate manager. So I write in the paper with Luke 16, one to seven, the story of the uh, unjust manager or the shrewd manager as you see it, the hidden transcript of Jesus' uh, subversive activity comes out. But he knows that this kind of uh, practice, this praxis of his can lead to uh, severe uh, punishment. <laughs> I see in the, uh, one of the sayings of Q, uh, whoever does not reckon that we uh, could arrive on a cross uh, is not my disciple. Uh, he knows that uh, when he messed with the, the debt and tax system of the imperial order, you can easily end up being crucified. Just as a matter of interest, that particular passage was the, the lectionary reading while we were, were in Jerusalem. And the, and the Archbishop Sahel was there, and he actually preached on that very text. Uh, so it's really interesting that we should be having this conversation now, and that was the text that he was using. Uh, but I have to say, that's, I don't think that his exegesis was quite what you, you're describing here. I'd like to add one, one footnote. Um, the, what I call Jesus' critique of the mammon ethic is very important. The curse of the storehouse, or the evil of the storehouse of the the wealthy landowner, uh, where things are gathered in that could be uh, used for the benefit of the village. But rather, now they're in the storehouse. Okay, uh, but in times of uh, dire straits for the villagers, they may go with an open hand to the landlord. Now they're in even a stronger uh, obligation, or a stronger obligation, and uh, so in good times, they're still not out of debt. Uh, in that uh, more comprehensive term, I'm using dependency relationship. When uh, liberation theology was, uh, you know, well known uh, in decades ago, dependency theories uh, were coming into, uh, into discussion about uh, the World Bank and its practices. Um, when I first started teaching at Santa Clara University, a colleague and I put on a debt conference, uh, and we had Walden Bellow, who was a uh, Philippine journalist who had uh, written about the World Bank practices in the Philippines, uh, and we had any number of really great speakers. It sounds like your your conference is going to bring some really really fine people uh, to think about our own situation. From the standpoint of Jesus scholarship, if the Christian tradition wants to think about what its initial impulse was, uh, that's a good reformation, um, a good reformation practice. Uh, what was the original word? Uh, it must look to Jesus of Nazareth, who saw uh, his situation as a kind of new Egypt, and so the table again could become the Passover table whenever tax gatherers or their scribes sat with debtors around that table. Uh, and the story was freedom, uh, a freedom uh, activity that we're doing here. Um, but I don't think uh, Jesus wanted simply a reverse patronage because his vision of freedom uh, is along the lines of uh, many contemporary thinkers in the past century, what's wrong with capitalism? And they always look to an alternative, uh, Karl Polanyi, 
uh, uh, Michael Harrington, and now some of the folks who are coming to the conference there, uh, of a more familial, uh, need-based exchange type of system. Uh, Polanyi, for instance, talked about the difference between uh, a substantive uh, uh, subsistence type of economy where ordinary exchanges of goods were, were really not accounted for too closely because it left the door open uh, for uh, re reciprocity relations. Whereas Polanyi said the status economy that developed in historical civilizations uh, began to lose sight of that, uh, that, that basic human type of uh, society. Polanyi said uh, before uh, capitalism, the economy was embedded within social relations. It was not a freestanding uh, entity like our capitalist markets within which all social relations are embedded. Land, labor, capital. Uh, I once thought about teaching a, a, an adult class starting with the question, would you sell your mother? Uh, and have us think about what well, can you commodify human relationships. So Jesus of Nazareth is an inspiration there for the Christian tradition. And uh, some of that was forgotten along the way. So, so that, that, that's a great leading to a very specific. Let's, 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 let's come down to some specifics of your book. So one of the really significant outcome of research in uh, Jesus' death and the Lord's Prayer has to do with the question of the original form of the Lord's Prayer, and, and you, you put up some, some, some tables about what we have today and what you believe are kind of the, is it five or six original lines? My argument was that the original prayer, we'll call it the prayer of Jesus, uh, went from the direct address, Abba, Father, to the, uh, the second table. And uh, those three petitions... Uh, bread, which I argue is not daily bread, but rather the estate bread uh, oh. is endangered. That is the bread that belongs to the estate of, uh, of the uh, patron, uh, in this case, God the Father. The debt petition and uh, the last petition, uh, which I read not as an eschatological uh a line in the prayer, but rather a reference to uh, the creditor's courts. So do not lead us into the creditor's court where we'll lose our shirt. Uh, tie that back again to uh, the cue saying about make friends with your creditor on the way, uh, but unfortunately uh, you are still obligated under a different kind of obligation. So uh, a reference to, I think, this creditor court existing within early Roman Galilee. Can we just be clear about what those four lines? Are? Could you could you could you say Jesus's prayer uh, as a prayer for us so that we're clear about which lines that okay. were the original Abba. lines? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we we Abba, Father, uh, give us the estate bread or the kingdom bread today. Forgive our debts as we release those in debt to us. Do not lead us into the creditor's quarter. Do not lead us to the unjust judge. All three are united in a package. That's what I was trying to say. It's, it's the, uh, the, you might say, the molecular hope of Jesus and his, his associates. Could that last line also be save us from the corrupt debt system? Yes. Or the corrupting uh, debt I, system. The, we we are we are um, what I would call uh, making interpretive inferences, and uh, the other thing to to point out is the prayer was originally about material issues, and in the tradition that I write about. Uh, the first table then adds on prayer elements uh, that are not inconsistent, but tend to move things more in a spiritualized direction. 
so that debt becomes sin in a moral sense. But we already talked about that. Uh, yeah, the word uh, chova in Aramaic can mean uh, both. Oftentimes, the morality issue uh, was a result of indebtedness. That the debtors come to Jesus, or when he encounters them, he's able to broker help for them because he knows people with resources or he connects them to resources. That's what anthropology talks about is the, the broker role. So he's brokering uh, on behalf of his clients, but his vision is not to indebt them to himself, but rather to free them for one another. That is, he's not after a vertical patronage again. Uh, he's after a horizontal uh, familial ethos. And even the stranger is included in this. I think we see this uh, in the early Jesus groups, in both in Jerusalem and in Paul's communities. Uh, now back to the prayer, uh, a number of those first table elements uh, are consonant with Jewish prayer tradition. So uh, later on, uh, your kingdom come, uh, you know, uh, your name be hallowed, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done. But in my article on the Lord's Prayer, I made a point that a peasant is not looking to some eschatological utopia. Uh, Jesus was concrete and in the moment. Uh, and some philosophers and theologians, uh, Martin Buber thought probably one of the most present people ever who ever lived, present to others. Uh, as Bonhoeffer said, the man for others. Uh, and that, that leads me to six. You make the point that the Lord's Prayer was not about spiritualized asking forgiveness uh, for, for day-to-day -day foibles and trespasses, but something like the deconstruction of the entire debt-based system. Am I reaching by saying that? You're not reaching, in my, my humble opinion, uh, because I think these ideas that we're discussing, we need to think, mull them over, think about them test them, look at them with different uh, side lights and the like. But so much is consonant when you think about uh, the uh, politics of debt in early Roman Galilee. I mean, we have two tremendous rebellions, both of which have clear and certifiable agrarian uh, elements. Uh, and all through these decades, uh, from Herod the Great's time uh, through uh, to the Judean Roman War, uh, there are evidences that the, uh, the lid is uh, rumbling, and then in 66 it blows the top. Um, and then my paper that I'm giving uh, argues that the Jerusalem elites didn't want rebellion, and we know that. They were in cahoots with the Romans. Sure. But in Galilee, they send the Pharisee Josephus up there to prevent the rebellion, whether it's called the domination system or the debt system. Uh, neither is consonant with the traditions of Israel that Jesus is embodying uh, someone like Michael Hudson, who is a, an economist, seeing Jesus uh, linked up to uh, deep traditions. And in our contemporary situation, people are trying to make a living, but they don't have a life. And this work that we're doing, trying to reimagine how our tradition can help us to live into a more humane and healthy future, seems to me what makes this work valuable. And I'd like you to ask you if you can say something about how the same fundamental debt-based system that we see uh, grappled with by Jesus, how that same debt system operates in today's globalized economic models. Well, how one got to uh, the top in the Roman period or the Greco-Roman period uh, wasn't necessarily through money. Uh, power garnered money and the elites were more concerned about their honor rating. What I'll call the replication issue or the analogy uh, of, the, of now over against then uh, is in the structural verticality. Uh, uh, those with uh, power and wealth 
managed to uh, indebt the rest. As Hudson points out, the villagers or the peasants are usually in arrears, which are kept uh, account of uh, through written documents, which are held in the archives. There were archives in Jerusalem. There were archives in Sepphoris. Uh, but money itself is an accounting system for debt. Because as I think uh, Jesus implies, you don't give your son a stone to eat or for bread. Uh, an oblique reference to you can't eat money. It's a false reality. Okay. And David Graeber himself says uh, obligations preceded money. Money just made it easier to account for obligations. Uh, so uh, I, I see Jesus uh, saying you cannot serve God and mammon as meaning uh, you cannot uh, truck with money in this set of circumstances. But in our own context, uh, people go into debt uh, for uh, usually uh, uh, reasons beyond their control. Quick, quick, quick question from left field. Yes or no? Will there be money in the kingdom of God? No. Thank you. Right. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> We're interested in this conference uh, in, in kind of beginning to think outside of this, this, this debt-based, interest-bearing monetary system to what an alternative might be for, as a basis for economics. Uh, given how devastating the system has been for 5,000 years, and Jesus was part of a long, long line of prophets who, who railed against it, what might an alternative be to the death-based monetary system? Jeff Bezos holds uh, literally billions in his bank. Why does he think he owns that? Uh, we need to think about what is really vali valuable. Uh, Marx thought about labor value and that the accretion of labor in products was then taken from the labor. <laughs> uh, we may have a similar situation with Jesus and the fishers, uh, because if they fished the lake, they were fishing a royal monopoly. Uh, Herod thought he owned it. Uh, his uh, brother Philip thought he owned it. Mm -hmm. And the fishers had to turn in the fish. You just can't go to the lake there and throw in your fishing pole because an officer, an official will be right there soon. Uh, now Jesus and his folks on the boat, and it's interesting that the Galilee boat could hold 12 plus three, uh, could go out in the lake and surreptitiously uh, have a good meal and talk about what's wrong with things and nobody would overhear them. We have the word faith. At the end of his book, David Graeber says, Friends make promises, and we need to find a society in which friendship and trustworthy promises are being made, and that we are not measuring our status, success, by false measures of uh, numbers in a bank account. Uh, that is, we have the vision in our tradition of a familial economy. Uh, and perhaps Jesus intuitively not only was going back to Israel, but going back to our early ancestors in the species who knew that if I give you something, I don't expect you to give me something back. But when I need something, I hope you'll be there for me. You said to me early on uh, that you believe in prayer. And so would you pray for our conference? I have the perfect prayer for your conference. Abba. Oh. <laughs> Give us our state bread today. Forgive our debts as we release those in debt to us. That is, give us true freedom. Yeah. And may our courts of justice deliver justice, especially for the widow and the orphan and the little people of this earth. Amen. 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 Doug, thank, thank you, you very much. much for this. God bless you. It's been a delight to meet you. And I hope we'll have some conversations in the future. <laughs>